Hi, Chem 151 students. Welcome back for our second and final video this week in lecture. Uh, this is going to be about reaction mechanisms. And so um, along the way, we have always said when we're describing the rate law that the exponents in the rate law are not necessarily equal to the coefficients in the reaction. And you may have wondered, why is that? Why is it sometimes the same? And that's uh, what's going to be explained by reaction mechanisms here. So um, the mechanism of reaction is the sequence of individual steps that eventually lead to the, the formation of the products. Uh, the problem with some of these steps is they can happen very quick. And so we're not always, we can't always see them happening. They happen so fast. Uh, so that's why we basically take a guess at what the reaction mechanism is. And as long as the mechanism is consistent with what we observe for experimental data for the rate law, then we say that this reaction mechanism may be correct. Uh, so the, the individual steps in a reaction have a special name. They're called elementary steps. Uh, and each of these describe one molecular event, meaning a collision of two molecules or a breaking up of one molecule into pieces. So uh, this ele the elementary step uh, is described not by order. We're not going to use that term for elementary steps. Instead, we're going to call it molecularity. And it's going to be like order, but it's going to be for elementary steps in which we are proposing that these are the actual molecular events that are happening. The overall reaction doesn't tell us exactly what's going on and what bonds are breaking in what order the elementary steps do. So the rate law for an elementary step can be deduced from the stoichiometry as long as it's as it's an elementary step. Okay. So this is where you have to we've been I've been telling you since the beginning you can't get the rate order from the, the coefficients in the balanced equation from the stoichiometry. But if you have an elementary step, then the molecularity is inferred from, from the, the uh, stoichiometry for the, for the elementary step equation, only for elementary steps. That's really important, OK? So uh, in terms of molecularity, a one molecule breaking up into more than one, this is referred to as unimolecular. And it only depends on the concentration of the one product molecule. So the rate will be uh, will have a molecularity of one, uh, and the rate law can de can can describe this elementary step as rate equals concentration to the first power only because this is an elementary step. If we have two reactant molecules A hitting each other, we say this is a bimolecular reaction, and the rate will will uh, depend on the concentration of A squared, uh, two reactant molecules hitting each other. If we have two reactants A and B, and those two must collide in order for the reaction to happen, this is also bimolecular. Two molecules must collide. The rate law for this elementary step will be the rate constant times the concentration of A to the first power times the concentration of B to the first power. In this example, we have two molecules of A reacting with one molecule of B. This is referred to as a termolecular reaction, and its rate would be dictated as the rate constant times the concentration of A squared times B to the first power. And it's only because these are considered elementary steps that we can infer these orders from the, from the, the coefficients in the balance equation, because these are elementary steps. This doesn't apply to normal reactions. We're assuming that this is the only thing that's happening in this step. One note about termolecular reactions too is that they are exceedingly rare. Three molecules colliding uh, is, is a rare event. Two molecules, very common. Three molecules hitting each other all in just the right way to react, super rare. So if someone proposes a termolecular elementary step they have to have really, really solid uh, backing and evidence for people to believe that that is likely. Because two molecules hitting each other, that can happen all the time. Three hitting each other in just the right way all at once, very, very unlikely. So most reasonable elementary steps are going to be unimolecular or bimolecular.
Although termolecular steps do happen, they tend to happen in very slow reactions because they're, they're very unlikely. So uh, let's say we have the following elementary steps proposed for a, re a reaction uh, mechanism. So the first step is that this NO2Cl makes NO2 and Cl atom, and then the NOCl reacts with the Cl and makes NO2 and Cl. So first of all, just a little bit of terminology here. You can see that the chlorine here is produced in the first reaction, and then it's immediately consumed. This happens very regularly. Chlorine here is a reactive intermediate. Intermediate in, that's a little hard to read, reactive intermediate. It's very, very reactive. It doesn't stick around for very long. And this is the reason why we must propose mechanisms because this chlorine atom may be there for such a short period of time that it's impossible to measure it in any normal way that we would measure the speeds of reactions. It will be gone in a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. Like a, 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 some, some reactions are in the nanoseconds, uh, picoseconds even. Um, part of my research was to measure the uh, nanosecond scale reaction times using a very specialized instrument that could stop a reaction on nanosecond time scales. It's not an easy thing to try to catch these reactive intermediates. And so uh, seven of my years, uh, or at least five of them, the last two writing up my dissertation was working on this home-built machine that was intended to catch these very, very quickly reacting intermediates that are there and gone usually before anyone can notice and that's why we can never be sure that a reaction is actually an elementary step because some element elementary steps happen so fast it's hard to notice that 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 they've happened um, so if we want to write the overall reaction for for this uh, we're going to have to add up the two reactions and so let's uh let's go ahead and do that so i'm just going to point out here that chlorine is going to be on both sides. It's produced and then it is consumed because it's a reactive intermediate. Uh, so it's no longer going to be there. And then if we add these two up, we're going to get on the left side two NOCL, NO2Cl, so two NO2Cl gas. And on the right side, we're going to get two NOs, the one on the top here. Oops. And the one on the bottom, uh, I didn't want to circle that though. Okay. So here, the, the one on the top, the one on the bottom, that's two. So we're going to have uh, two NO2s. And then we're going to have one Cl2. So this is an example of the reaction we would actually observe right here. So we would see two NO2Cls going in, and what would come out is two NO2s and, and chlorine. We would probably never be aware that, that a chlorine atom was ever produced in this reaction. And that is why we can't assume, just by looking at the overall reaction, that this would be bimolecular. It's because we can't be sure that there aren't multiple elementary steps happening uh, so we have to go off of the experimentally determined rate law. Now in terms of molecularity, the first step here involves only one reactant molecule, so it's unimolecular. And the second step involves two, uh, this reactant molecule here and the chlorine atoms, so we would call this bimolecular. So the first reaction is unimolecular, the second reaction is bimolecular. And if we're writing a rate law for each step, so uh, for the first one, so I'll write this as rate one, rate one. So for rate one, our rate law is going to be the rate constant times the concentration of NO2Cl to the first power because there's only one. So we can say to the first power because this is an elementary step. We can use the coefficients only if it's an elementary step. And even then, we don't really know that the ele elementary steps that we're proposing are necessarily right. Like I said, sometimes it's really hard to tell 
what's actually going on. We'll infer it from the rate law. Now, a rate law to describe the second reaction would be, uh, and I'm going to call this K1, I'm going to call this rate constant K2, a different rate constant for a different reaction. That will be the concentration of NO2Cl times the concentration of the chlorine atom. And we can only do this because we're assuming that these are elementary steps. And so here are these uh, same thing that I wrote in case you want to look at it later. Um, okay. And so, as I said, if we have a reaction like this, we can't be sure that this mechanism that we proposed is, is actually what happens. But we can be more sure if we can confirm that this, this mechanism that we've proposed is consistent with the experimentally observed rate law and rate orders for the reaction. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can determine uh, if a proposed mechanism of this kind is, is consistent with the observed rate law and is thus reasonable. So first of all, we have to talk about <clears throat> what's going on with these elementary steps. And for these elementary steps, some of them will happen very, uh, very, very quickly, and others will happen much more slowly. So going back to our last reaction, if I was going to look at this, I would guess that this first reaction is probably going to go very slowly relative to the second one. Why? Because this chlorine is extremely reactive. So if there's any amount of chlorine, it's going to definitely want to react with the NO2Cl. The first reaction, though, involves breaking a bond between a nitrogen and a chlorine, which is going to probably have a higher activation energy. So I expect this one to have the, the higher activation energy based on my intuition, because I have to break a bond between the chlorine and the nitrogen here. I got to break it. Whereas here, I expect this to be fast because this chlorine atom is so reactive, it's going to want to react. Uh, so this will probably have a lower activation energy. Now, you don't need to be able to predict what has a high activation energy and a low activation energy, because in the problems I give you and the book gives you, we will tell you whether the reaction is, is considered to be slow or fast. But that's a reason why they might be slow or fast. So some reactions are in, in some of these elementary steps are going to happen slower than others. And that's going to really affect what our rate will be. Uh, so one of these steps will be the rate determining step. So let me give you an example of a rate determining step that uh, is probably they try to avoid it like McDonald's or something like that. So let's say that you're cooking a burger right uh, at McDonald's or something and uh, there's only uh, but you have a you have a small kitchen so there's only one burner so you can only cook one burger at a time and it takes five minutes you gotta cook the burger and then flip it and then after that you hand it over to the next person and they assemble the burger with the lettuce and all the stuff and that takes them one minute <clears throat> now if you just have one burner to cook one burger how fast are you going to get burgers coming out? Well, you'll cook one every five minutes, and then you'll pass it over to the next person, and that person will be packaging it up, and then that will take them one minute, and then they'll be waiting, and it'll be another five minutes. And so a burger is going to come out every five minutes because the fact that the person can put it together in one minute doesn't matter because that's being done while the next burger is cooking, right? Uh, so every time it's going to be five minutes till the next one comes out. Because then they'll package it up. Okay, the other person already started cooking the burger. So four more minutes pass, that's a total of five minutes. And the person packages up for one minute, then four more minutes pass, and another one. So it's always five minutes to make a burger. That's what it's like for the chemistry too. It, it, if the first step has to happen before the second one does, if it's slow, let's say. Here, the, the rate determining step was the first one, cooking the burger. So if the first step is a slow one, then that whole step has to happen before the second step can ever happen. Uh, and it is the rate determining step. Sometimes the second step can be the rate determining step. Uh, 
let's say that there's you know a giant burner and you can cook 10 burgers at a time but to package a 10 burgers uh takes a person 10 minutes but only five minutes to fry them because there's only one person packaging up burgers then it's going to be the rate determining step will be the packaging of the burgers so the rate determining step can be the first one the second one or anywhere along the line but it's going to be the rate determining step that decides how fast this reaction can go so the slowest step in a reaction is the rate determining or rate limiting step uh, so here's another example of a, a reaction that happens in the atmosphere all the time no2 uh, smog uh, reacting with co makes nitrogen monoxide and CO2. And so this kind of stuff happens all the time when we're trying to figure out what's going on in the atmosphere. We propose a mechanism. Uh, and the mechanism that's proposed is this. One NO2 molecule hits another NO2 molecule. When they hit each other, NO3, a reactive intermediate, is made, and NO. This step, we're saying it's probably slow. Then another NO2 hits a CO, and that makes a, an NO2 and a CO2. I feel like there's something wrong there. Let me fix that. Oops. There we go. Okay. Oops, I need to fix it. I think my reaction is wrong. Yeah, I messed up. NO3. Yeah, I should say NO3, not NO2. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Then this reactive intermediate, NO3, reacts with CO, and it gives it its oxygen atom here. And so that one oxygen atom goes from the NO3 over to CO, you get CO2 and NO2. And this step is fast. Okay. So the whole rate is going to be determined by this reaction. So we can write a rate law based on that reaction. Uh, so the observed rate law is the rate equals K times NO2 concentration squared. And this is because if we write a rate law for this rea reaction, we have rate 1 equals rate constant times the concentration. And we've got two NOs here. This is bimolecular. It will be NO2 squared. 2 NOs. We could have just written this as 2 NO2s also, but I wanted to emphasize that 2 NO2 molecules are hitting each other. And that is the rate. We could describe the, the rate of the second reaction. That's going to be, so this would be K1, this would be K2, times the concentration of NO3, times the concentration of CO. However, that doesn't matter because this is the the fast rate the rate determining step is the first one so the rate law will be described uh, the, the overall rate will be described by that first rate law notice that this reaction has co as a reactant but the 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 co is not important for the rate because it's involved in the fast step and so this reaction is second order with respect to NO2, even though there's no 2 in front here. This reaction up here is second order with respect to NO2 and zero order with respect to CO. So this is why you can't just look at an overall reaction and know what the, the order is going to be. In this case, the order here is second order with respect to NO2. And it is zero order with respect to CO. The orders are not the same as the coefficients in the balanced equation because the mechanism has a slow step that only involves NO2 molecules hitting one another. It's bimolecular for NO2. So if we have a slow first step, in general, the rate law for the rate determining step will, will be the rate law for the overall reaction. Now, this is this is easiest when it is the first reaction that's slow so we're going to go over the situation where the first reaction is slow which is the easier one then we'll go over a situation where a, re a, a reaction that isn't the first one is the slow one and that will be a little bit more difficult so 
if you want to have a valid mechanism, so you, pr you, you propose a mechanism, it has to meet these criteria. First of all, the elementary steps have to add up to the overall equation. Otherwise, it's not describing that overall balanced equation. Two, the elementary steps have to be reasonable, meaning they are most likely unimolecular or bimolecular. If they're termolecular, you better have some very, very strong backup for that. And it must be describing a slow reaction because termolecular is very unlikely. And the mechanism must correlate with the observed rate law. So uh, you're, again, the observed rate law is where we get our, our information. That is how we decide the rate law. A mechanism is not valid unless it is consistent with experimental data. The mechanism is an educated guess. It's a hypothesis, okay? Uh, it cannot be proven. We just, it can be though consistent with what we observe experimentally. And it can help to describe the way the reaction works, especially for uh, atmospheric reactions. So there's a great atmospheric research center at UCR uh, and, and an engineering lab called CSIRT off campus. They have giant, basically plastic bags the size of buildings that they do environmental reactions on. And sometimes they have mechanisms with dozens uh, of, of steps in them uh, to describe these. Um, but their, their mechanism needs to be consistent with their observed rate law. So here's an example question that I could ask you. Their overall reaction, uh, if we have an overall reaction, uh, two NO2s plus F2 makes two NO2F2. And we observe experimentally that the rate law is rate constant times NO2 concentration times F2 concentration. So the, the rate law is first order with respect to NO2 and first order with respect to F2. Uh, the accepting mechanism for this reaction, uh, another, another atmospheric reaction, very likely atmospheric reaction, less likely than the other ones, but uh, the first step here is a slow step. It involves NO2 and F2 reacting, makes NO2F and F atom. The F atom is a reactive intermediate, goes into the next step, reacts with NO2, and makes NO2F. Is this mechanism reasonable? Okay, so let's go step by step. We have to check to see that it meets the three criteria. Number one, does it add up correctly? Does it add up to the overall reaction on the bottom? Let's double check. So our reactive intermediate here is fluorine atom. We have one on each side. It's going to cancel. Now if we add up the rest, we have two NO2s. So we have that right here. One F2. Yep. And then two NO2Fs. Okay. So this mechanism adds up to the overall reaction. Number two, are these steps reasonable? They should be unimolecular or bimolecular. The first one is bimolecular. The second one is bimolecular. So these are reasonable steps. Finally, is it consistent with observed rate law? And the way we determine that is we write a rate law for the slow reaction here. So rate one equals K1 times the concentration of NO2 times the concentration of F2. And because the first step is the slow step, we can say the rate law indicated by the first step should be consistent with the overall rate law if this mechanism is valid, and it is. And so we're done. It's, it's relatively quick if the first step is slow. It's a bit more involved if, if the slow step is not the first step. But we have checked here that we have uh, hit all three criteria. So this is a reasonable reaction. The elementary steps sum to the overall balanced equation. Both steps are bimolecular. Step one is a slow step. Rate one correlates with the observed rate law. Uh, rate the second one, we don't care because it's not the slow step. This is the slow step. And so the mechanism is therefore reasonable. Now, what about if we have a fast initial step and a slower second step or a subsequent step? Could be a third or fourth. Uh, so that's this example here. We have an overall reaction of two NO molecules reacting with O2 makes two NO2s. 
and it has an experimentally observed rate law of rate equals rate constant times concentration of NO squared times concentration of O2. And so here's a proposed mechanism, and we should see, is this consistent? Uh, is, this, is this reasonable? So first, we should check, do these add up to the overall reaction here? Well, our reactive intermediate in this case is the NO3. It's produced and then it's consumed, one on each side, so that goes away. Then we add it up, we get two NOs plus O2 makes uh, at two NO2s. Okay, great. Next, uh, are these steps reasonable? Well, the first step is bimolecular with NO and O2, reasonable. Second step, bimolecular with NO3 and NO2 reasonable. Uh, but here is the issue. The NO, if we, if we, let's write out the rate. So the rate law for the slow step, I'll write it over here. I have a little bit more room. So the rate law for the slow step is the second one. Rate two equals K2 times the concentration of NO3 to the first power times the concentration of NO to the first power. The problem here is that NO3 is not a reactant in our initial equation. If we were monitoring this reaction, we may not even ever have seen any NO3 because the first step happened fast, the NO3 got used up as soon as when it was made, and then, you know, we, we can't describe the rate law uh, for for a, a reaction by using concentrations of things that are not the reactants. So what we're going to do is we're going to rely on the fact that this first reaction is happening so fast that by the time this second reaction gets going, what has happened is that so much NO3 has been produced that this reaction is also running in reverse at the same speed that it's running in the forwards direction. So when we first start out, we've got only NO and NO2. So those are reacting forward, forward, making more and more NO3 really fast. Then once we get enough NO3, this reaction can also start running in reverse. And because the second reaction is so slow, this reaction will get to the point where the reverse reaction is running as fast as the forwards reaction. This is a state that we call equilibrium. And equilibrium is what we're going to study in great detail in the next chapter. But this is what happens when you have so much products with along with the reactants that the backwards reaction can go along at the same speed as the forwards reaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to write two rate laws here. Both of these reactions are happening. The forward reaction, so we're going to say, we're going to call this rate one the forward reaction, forward. So rate one is gonna be K1 times the reactant concentrations, NO times O2. Then we're gonna call the reverse reaction, we're gonna call it, so this would be the reverse reaction, we're gonna call this rate negative one. And we'll call the K for that reaction, the rate constant, K negative one. So in the reverse reaction, the reactant is the NO3. And so we're gonna multiply times the concentration of the NO3. Now what we wanna do is we know that our rate law is gonna be described by this equation. But we don't want this in here, NO3, because that is not one of our initial reactants. What we wanna do is we wanna substitute the NO3 with something else. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna solve this second equation for NO3, and then we're gonna plug the NO3 in. Okay, so I'm gonna do that right underneath here. So I'm just gonna take this down, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna isolate for NO3, so I'm gonna multiply times one over the, the K negative one. That's going to cancel these right here. And I'm going to multiply this side times 1 over the k negative 1, 2. And so now on this side, all I'm going to have left is the NO3. And then I can plug that result into there. 
So let me write that now. Now I've got from, from up there, it's going to be going right down here. NO3 concentration equals uh, rate negative 1 over K negative 1. Okay. But here's the big but. We said that the forward and the reverse reactions are happening at the same speed, right? So, actually, I kind of got ahead of myself there. But what I can do is I can make the rate 1 equal to the rate negative 1. And so that's what I'm going to do. Rate 1 here is equal to rate negative 1 because this reaction is going the same speed in the reverse reaction as it is in the forward direction. So I'm going to take all of this because, so rate negative 1 is equal to rate 1. But rate 1 is equal to all of this. So I'm going to plug that in there. So I'm going to get k1 over k negative 1. And then I've got these NO and O2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of that. So that's the concentration of NO3. I'm going to take all of that and I'm going to plug it in right there. Okay. And I'm running it out of space above my head. So I'm just going to write the last part right at the top in blue. So let, let's plug it in now. We get rate 2, which is the rate, equals... We're going to have K2. We also have K1, K negative 1. And then for concentrations, here we've got concentration NO times concentration O2. And then we have another concentration NO. And so now I'm just going to call this rate. I'm going to call this just k and then I'm gonna have NO squared I'm gonna have O2 and that rate law is actually exactly the same as proposed rate law so this mechanism is consistent with rate law so I know that was a little all over the place because I kind of squeezed myself into a corner there. So let me just review. Uh, so the first step is the fast step. Uh, and the, the second step is the slow step. So we base the rate off the slow step. It's the rate constant times the NO3 concentration times the NO concentration. But we have to state the rate in terms of the initial reactants, NO and NO2. We have to state it in terms of these. We can't state it in terms of NO3. But the, the fast reaction reaches, reaches equilibrium very quickly. So the rate forward equals the rate reverse. The rate forward, rate forward here, K1 times NO times O2 equals the rate reverse. I don't know why that turned into a D there. That should be an arrow, but uh, K negative 1 times NO3. We solve this for NO3 by dividing each side by k negative 1. And so we get k1 over k with negative 1 equals NO times NO2 concentration. Okay, then we plug all of this right here goes in for this right there. And we get rate 2 equals k2 times k1 over k negative 1 NO times O2 times NO. We rewrite this as rate equals K. We just call this all these constants. We put them together and call them K. It's NO squared times O2. So the, the, all these rate constants themselves are a constant, so that's why we can call them just K. And uh, the, the rate law that we determined is the same as the, the uh, rate law determined by experiment. So this mechanism is consistent with the rate law.
And so, and so this is a good mechanism. You can see that it was significantly more difficult to, uh, to show that uh, we had to do a little bit of algebra when the, the first step is not the slow one. Uh, but um, that, that's, how, that's how you do it. And uh, this kind of work is how we describe atmospheric, it's really, really important atmospheric chemistry, but in all kinds of chemical reactions that we want to know their speeds, their relative speeds, industrial chemistry as well. Uh, and so that's, for, and so finally, uh, for any mechanism, only the react, reactants involved in the slow rate determining step uh, appear in the overall rate law. So it's a slow uh, rate determining step that determines the rate law, basically. Um, <clears throat> so when this is happening, essentially you've got two reactions that, that go on now. So for a multi-step reaction, we've got the first reaction where it needs its own activation energy to reach its transition state. Then it forms some reactive intermediates. And you can see why these reactive intermediates are so, so unstable. They could very easily go backwards and make the, the reactants again, or they could go and make the products. The activation energy for finishing the reaction, the activation energy for step two, is quite small. So this reaction can, can just proceed forward right away. Uh, and so this is, this is an example of a reaction where we have a slow first step. See, the activation energy is very large for the first step. It's very small for the second step. And so this would be an example of a reaction with a slow first step. This second energy diagram is a, an example of a reaction with a slower second step. Uh, so here the activation energy for the first step is pretty low, but then to get to the second step, you've got to reach a high, high activation energy. Uh, before you get to the products. So each each of these reactions is going to have their own transition state, then it's going to have some in-between products, the reactive intermediates, and then it's going to have a second step with a second transition state, and then it'll go on to make the products. Um, so we've talked about now several factors that can affect the reaction rate. We've talked about how the concentration can affect the reaction rate and how the temperature can affect the reaction rate. The third factor is the presence of a catalyst. And so uh, a catalyst can speed up a reaction, but it's not used up in the reaction. Just the fact that it's there and interacting with the reactant molecules speeds up the reaction. It speeds up the reaction because it provides a reaction pathway that has a lower activation energy than if that, that catalyst were not present. Uh, so this catalyst will speed up both the forward and the reverse reactions because when it lowers the activation energy, that has an impact on both the forward and the reverse reactions. Uh, notice, note that the catalyst is not going to affect the delta H of the reaction. It only affects the, the energy of the transition state. So that has no impact on the delta H of the reaction. This can be best shown with a uh, with an energy diagram. So let's say you have a reaction where you have reactants A and B and the catalyst is present. So without the catalyst, it would undergo this reaction where it has to produce uh, some transition state uh, and then go on and produce the products. But if you have the transition state, instead the react one or more reactant molecules will interact with the catalyst. Uh, so here we have a, a reaction where we have an intermediate product that was made involving the catalyst. And the, the transition state to make, that pro, to make that product was smaller than the transition state without the catalyst. Next, this complex between the catalyst and, and the other reactant. So here we can see A re, did some kind of interaction with the catalyst and made some intermediate called C. And that intermediate is now reacting with reactant B. It produces a second transition state. And then the catalyst is released, and we have the products. And so the catalyst did interact with, with reactant A along the way to make this C. But by the end, the catalyst was spit out again, and it, it was never consumed in the reaction. And so the, having this catalyst there allows for 
um, uh, the reaction to take an alternative pathway where it reacts and makes an intermediate with the catalyst, but then the catalyst is released again. And uh, this, this kind of reaction happens all of the time in biology. Uh, I'll show you some examples of that. Our life would not be possible with the, without the presence of biological catalysts. And many of the important products that we use all the time would just be produced too slowly uh, if, if it weren't for the, uh, the, the fact that we can use catalysts to speed up those reactions. So here's an example of ca uh, catalysis as well. Uh, if you have a uh, solution of H2O2, and you put in sodium bromide. So that's the white powder here. Uh, oxygen gas will form very quick, quickly uh, because bromide catalyzes the decomposition of H2O2. And then the bromide uh, turns into bromine. And you see, that's why, why the solution is, is, uh, is brown here. So a solution, a solution of hydrogen peroxide, you can buy hydrogen peroxide from the store, like, uh, you know, 30%, not 30%, probably like, nine percent in water or something and it's just going to sit there it's not going to be bubbling uh, but if you put a catalyst in there like this sodium bromide it will start bubbling right away uh, there's also catalysts in your skin so that's why if you put hydrogen peroxide in a cut uh, it gets catalyzed and and produces oxygen it also res, uh, results in the formation of of uh, things that kill the bacteria intermediates that kill the bacteria Uh, this is what would be called a homogeneous catalyst, by the way. It's homogeneous because the sodium bromide dissolves in the water, so they're all in the same phase. This is as opposed to a heterogeneous catalysis. A heterogeneous catalysis, a good example of that, is uh, what happens in the catalytic converter in your car. Uh, or in the hydrogenation of hydrocarbons, such as uh, vegetable oils. You might have heard of hydrogenated vegetable oil or margarine. Uh, that is also uses metal surface here to catalyze the reaction of hydrogen and the oils in vegetable oil to make uh, saturated fats, which are solid, and you can spread them like a margarine. Uh, so this is an example of heterogeneous catalysis because the, the metal is a solid and the reactants undergoing the reaction are gases. They're H2, and in this case, ethene, which is also a gas. And this, is, this picture shows you a good example of the way catalysts work. Uh, often what catalysts are doing is by, by the reactant reacting with the catalyst, what often happens is that the reactant will be held in a particular position, which makes it easier for a successful collision to occur. So you can see here, these hydrogen atoms get held in this position on the surface, which makes a su successful collision with the ethene much more likely because they're just in the spot where they can react one of each of these with a hydrogen atom. Also, often the, the catalyst material will help to pull apart and weaken the bonds that exist that need to be broken for the reaction to happen. So you can see when this hydrogen attaches to the metal surface, it starts to get its bonds pull apart between its hydrogen atoms, which basically lowers the activation energy for it to react with the ethene gas here. So it's doing two things. Again, it's weakening the bond in the reactant molecule here, and it's also getting it into the correct orientation to collide with the ethene for, for a reaction. And so the ethene then collides with one of these hydrogen atoms and picks it up. Then it collides with another hydrogen atom, picks it up, and then the ethene, ethene becomes ethane and it flies away. So this is an example of heterogeneous catalysis, where the reactant molecules are a different state of matter than the, uh, the, um, the, the, the ca catalyst here. This also c occurs in your catalytic converter. Uh, they're very expensive because they're highly porous materials with usually expensive metals that provide a lot of surface area so that all these NO gases that we've been talking about, like uh, NO and NO2 and NO3 and all these, they call those NOx in, in atmospheric chemistry. Uh, on those surfaces, those, those uh, molecules will react very quickly and will spit out of your catalytic converter, will spit out 
nitrogen and oxygen, which is just air. Uh, so that's another example of a heterogeneous catalysis. We have very good catalytic, con whoops, I'm kind of in the way here. <laughs> It'll make NO2 and O2 air. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's another example of heterogeneous catalysis. It's really, really important for our daily lives, uh, in California especially. The, the uh, introduction of these very efficient catalytic converters in Southern California over the last you know, 30, 40 years has really, really decreased the air pollution. Back when I was a kid, and I'm not even that old, I'm 40, uh, some days they wouldn't lay it, let us play on the playground before we had these nice catalytic converters because there'd be too much NOx in the air and they'd say it was a smog day and we'd have to, you know, not go out in the playground. That doesn't happen anymore uh, thanks to those regulations and those uh, better catalytic converters that do this heterogeneous catalysis. Another example is biological catalysis. Uh, so biological catalysts are proteins that have specific forms and functions. They're called enzymes. And thanks to uh, these, the presence of these are reactions, the ones, for example, that do metabolism and make energy for us or construct parts of our body. These reactions will, uh, will happen millions or billions or even many more times faster than they otherwise would without these biological catalysts. These biological catalysts are very specified, uh, so they can, in some cases, fit to the substrates or the reactant molecules, often called substrates in biology. They can fit them like a locking key, meaning these two substrates fit right into these specially evolved pockets on the enzyme and this gets them right in the right orientation and in the and with the the right setup to bond and then produce the product increasing the rate of this kind of reaction very 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 much millions billions maybe in many more times faster another model of enzyme action is called the induced fit and this is where an enzyme has a pocket that will that will mold itself essentially to the reactant molecules or substrates. So as they get close, the, there's an attraction between the atoms in the protein and the atoms in the, the reactant substrates here, and it, they kind of pull on all of each other and get everything into place, and then the reaction can occur. Uh, so this is the way many uh, biological catalytic reactions occur. Another great example of catalysis, this one a negative one, is back in uh, you know in the 60s and 70s and stuff. We used to use a lot of refrigerants and hairsprays and stuff that had uh, propellants that were chlorofluorocarbons, meaning they had the atoms chlorine, they had chlorine and fluorine and carbon atoms in them in particular arrangements, chlorofluorocarbons. Well, it turns out that the fluor chlorofluorocarbons actually are uh, highly reactive with the ozone. And so the result was that it was observed um, that between the 80s and the, the mid-90s, there was a great depletion of ozone uh, near the North Pole and in many places in the atmosphere. And ozone by itself is very small concentrations usually in the atmosphere, but there needs to be enough to scavenge or to react with all the highly reactive uh, species that are produced when the sun's rays hit oxygen. So when the sun shines on our atmosphere, it produces oxygen atoms, but these oxygen atoms are very highly reactive. And if we're being exposed to these oxygen atoms, they could, they could react with our own molecules and cause cancer. Uh, and so the, a big topic back in those days was the hole in the ozone layer. These days, it's not a big deal because of very good science and very good regulation. Uh, it, it was in the, the 80s where the, the chlorofluorocarbons for refrigerators and hairsprays and other things were banned, and uh, they're no longer used. We use other molecules that are like them, and over time, this ozone hole has shrunk. This was a, an example of a problem that we could easily solve with good science, good regulation. Uh, just to look at the uh, energy diagram here, the presence of chlorofluorocarbons uh, 
like these these chlorine atoms here resulted in a catalysis of the the uh, destruction of ozone into O2, and so it was a much lower activation energy for that reaction compared to the normal reaction of uh, ozone with oxygen atoms, and so we had that depletion of the ozone layer. Um, one thing, so we talked about a lot of atmospheric reactions. That's a really big application for um, uh, for for reaction kinetics. Also, biology, as you saw, it's very important there. Uh, and and so at the end here, we just kind of want to wrap it up with a few examples of how catalysis and reaction kinetics are very important to some of the most important reactions that we uh, that we study. And so that wraps up the kinetics chapter. Uh, and uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it. And uh, this is, again, a short week, only two videos. So that's it. Go ahead and finish. Uh, I gave you a handful of homework problems to finish. And then uh, this week, you have experiment one due as well. And, um, and then for your discussion, what we've got is a uh, discussion where I just have you watch some YouTube videos to kind of review as we get ready for the test. And uh, and check out a few YouTube channels to see if there's you know someone you might like their lectures. So for me, I'm just getting used to online teaching. I'm getting used to making videos and stuff. But for some people, they've been doing it for quite some time. So I, you might find you know someone's videos that that kind of someone's style that jives with you that you want to watch more of their videos. Uh, and sometimes they can even be a substitute for my own, uh, depending on if they cover the same topic. So the discussion is going to be about just kind of looking around for YouTube channels and recommending them to your friends in this class, whichever one you happen to like and to say what you like about them. And then of course, uh, as we get to midweek, I'll be releasing the quiz. Um, in addition, it's your first week of in-person lab. So some of you I'll be seeing very soon for in-person labs uh, and and we're on the lab rotation so you're going to want to check the lab rotation schedule to see which experiments you should be working on during which time periods so make sure to check that out it will be different for everyone but this week everyone will be turning in experiment one uh, and next week everyone will turn in experiment two and experiment three you'll just start them all at different times but turn them all in next week and uh, all right, uh, and I'll see you guys on the next video or an office hour, or actually for some of you in lab uh, soon and some of you in office hours uh, very soon. And uh, have a good one.